everybody, thank you so much for clicking on this video. Unless you have been living under a rock for the past 40 years, you probably know who Oprah is. And unfortunately, Oprah has been put in the spotlight a lot because of her weight and the way that her body looks, which is super messed up. I just think like the discourse around any bodies, but specifically women's bodies is um, annoying. And we've luckily made a lot of strides to stop doing that. But I think a lot of the damage has been done with Oprah, unfortunately. You know, I think that because she has been preyed upon for the way that she looks for so long, she has found herself with some questionable partners. Also, I realize Oprah is like, is she a billionaire? Is she a billionaire? She's, she's fine. But I wanna to talk today about the discourse that Oprah is kind of leading as we get into these weight loss drugs. The weight loss drug era, we can call it. It's like, it's a Taylor Swift tour. I'm actually not gonna to talk too much about the medications in this video. I wanna talk a little bit more about some of the people that she brings on to platform because they sound like quacks. The inspiration for this video was actually taken from BioLane or Dr. Lane Norton. I'm gonna leave his video linked down below where he talks a little bit about Oprah and one of the guests that she had on recently. And Dr. Lane made some really excellent points in his video, but I wanna add in my two cents because I think that I have some things to expand upon a little bit more. Also side note, I don't think I'm gonna be able to monetize this video because I'm stealing clips from Oprah. So please go watch something else after this. Give it a little thumbs up and a comment and uh, get me some AdSense money. Anyway, let's watch the first video. There's something in some people's brains that works differently than other people's brains. Your husband's brain is different than yours. Yes. And we've seen those people who can eat anything they want and seemingly not gain weight. And then we're the adipose holders here. Adipose. Adipose. Yes. How do you spell it? A-D-I-P-O-S-E. Okay. okay, so first off the bat, adipose is just fat. Adipose tissue is fat tissue, just so we're all on the same page. And what it seems like right off the bat, Oprah's kind of talking about are like body types, which brings me into like endomorph, ectomorph, mesomorph type of territory, which is not anything that has ever been supported by the medical community. <laughs> it's not real. I think I made a video about that at one point. I don't know where it is, it's somewhere. <laughs> so this idea that like some people will store more fat than others um, is true, but it's not because you have a different body type or because your brain is wired different. It's because you might have a lower metabolic rate or less energy expenditure during the day than somebody else. Every single single person will store body fat or adipose tissue if they take in more energy than they need. Again, there are not adipose holders. There are simply people who have a higher metabolic rate and use more energy throughout the day and people with a lower metabolic rate and use less energy at the end of the day. It is math. We, the adipose holders, know that if we looked at that apple, if I ate an apple pie at 11 o'clock at night, I would be two pounds heavier in the morning. Yeah, but it's it's likely not fat. It's honestly like if you had an apple pie, apple pie, <laughs> if you ate an apple pie, that is primarily sugar and carbs. And when we ingest carbs into the system, it's actually broken down into sugar or glucose. So same thing, right? It's probably just water weight from all of the carbs you just ate because carbs are going to act like a sponge in your body. So if you have more carbohydrates, your body's going to retain a lot more water. So honestly, if there's one night where you had a whole apple pie, I doubt that you gained two whole pounds of fat you probably gained two pounds of water and whatever is sitting in your bowel after you ate that apple pie. Now, if you ate an apple pie every single night, that's a completely different story. I, I mean, I can't eat, eat after a certain time. Yes. Yes, you can. That's a myth. You can eat anytime you want. The time of day has nothing to do with how your body <laughs> uses or stores energy. What I will say is that studies have shown that people who eat later at night typically make worse decisions. That can be for a host of reasons. You know, a lot of times, like we make decisions all day. Life is hard. At the end of the day, you don't wanna have to make really well sound decisions. That wasn't a sentence, but you get what I'm saying. Like you have decision fatigue at the end of the day and you're stressed and you want something comforting. So like, I do get that. And that is something that's true, but it has nothing to do with how your body is storing the food. The other thing you see a lot is that people restrict way too much during the day, whether they're doing it on purpose or whether they're too busy and they forget. And then at the end of the day, they're starving. So they make a decision like an apple pie, but there is nothing inherently different or wrong about eating at night. When it comes to the national conversation, around obesity, what are we getting wrong? I know you were a consultant for that movie, The Whale, which I thought was so profound. Thank you, yeah. thank you, and thank you so much for being here. Thank and, you, Dr. Rachel. And once again, this conversation is such an important one. And actually, in answering that question, I wanna add- Why is a psychologist talking about obesity? That's it. 
what we're getting right, right? Like we're, we're having this conversation and this is huge. And the whale, similarly, you know, it's, it's a step in the right direction. And what we need to continue doing is having these conversations about the fact that obesity is a disease. Because one of the things that we're getting wrong is this idea that it is calories in, calories out. And like Dr. Fatima just said, it's not that for everyone. Yes, it is. Yes, it is is. Why am I snapping? Yes, it is. <sighs> She's probably going to talk about hormones next. Okay. Calories in, calories out is a real thing for every single living human being on this planet. We cannot get around physics. You cannot create energy out of nothing or just like disappear energy. Like what is, what is, what is the energy cannot be created nor destroyed. That's the first law of thermodynamics, right? Did I paraphrase it? Did I get it? What people don't understand is that different people have different metabolic rates and hormones can affect those metabolic rates as well as a host of other things. But the big thing that we hear now is like, oh, well, you know, a calorie deficit doesn't work for me for weight loss because my hormones are messed up. No, it just means you're not in a calorie deficit. It might be harder for you to get into a deficit. That free calculator that you used online probably isn't telling you the correct number to be in a deficit, but if you're not losing weight, you're not in a deficit. End of story, period, that's it. It's that for some people, mm -hmm. but it's not for others. And people that really struggle with their weight, with their health and with obesity, it's not that. It's not about moving more and you know eating less. And that is what we have to change. Okay, it is about moving more and eating less, but that's terrible advice. <laughs> so I do agree there. Like, like it is that, but it's also like, what? that's not helpful to anybody because it gives no actual information on implementation. Like you can say that all day long to someone, right? Oh yeah, you just have to eat less and move more. How? If you have a nine to five job with an hour commute in each direction and you have to get up and feed your kids and take them to school and then pick them up at the end of the day and then cook dinner and then help your kids with their homework and like where do you fit in the eat less, move more? right? We also just have to remember like there are food deserts that are basically whole areas of the U.S. where people do not have access to quality food. And by quality, I mean uh, nutrient dense. I don't want to moralize food. There are whole areas that don't have affordable options, you know, things that your kids will actually eat. There's so many hyper palatable foods. You know, there is the education around food that's really missing, I think, in our country. And this video is not helping. So I agree that this advice is bad, like it's not actually helpful, but it's not false. <laughs> to change that conversation as we're doing here, we have to educate more people and raise more awareness about this. You know, I know that we're going to get pushback from a lot of people saying, oh, now it's a disease, Oprah. Now you're saying it's a disease. How do we make this conversation uh, accessible to pe for people to understand that it really is. I have zero issue calling obesity a disease. If you asked me the definition of a disease right now, I would be like, I don't know, let me Google it. So like, I don't even actually know like definitively disease, like what that qualifies as, you know what I'm saying? Because that's not my wheelhouse. I have no reason to be talking about diseases because I'm a personal trainer. This psychologist has no reason to be talking about diseases. Now we can talk about on my end, actionable steps to help people who are obese, you know, implement some healthier lifestyle changes. I'm sure that this psychologist can help people with the mindset aspect of it, but neither of us should be talking about disease formally, right? It's out of our wheelhouse. But my only question is how are we now then defining obesity? Because for a long time, and to my knowledge, that still the way that we're defining it is through BMI. And BMI is a very, very outdated way to measure someone's health. I did make a whole video about it if you want to know more, but you know, just taking someone's like height and weight, I don't think is enough for a diagnosis of a disease. So I would just be curious, how are we, what's the word I'm looking for? Not defining, not prescribing, diagnosing. This is why I don't talk about disease. <laughs> How are we diagnosing people, right? So I think it starts with shifting the language that we use, yes. right? So one of the things is, you know, using people first language, for instance, you know, it's a person with obesity, same as we would say with cancer, right? It's a person with cancer. And this is gonna start familiarizing people with So it's with a person this. with obesity. Exactly, yeah. or a person struggles with obesity. So really putting the person first you know, we don't want to define an individual by their medical condition. I can get on board with that. This is something that she seems very qualified to talk about. You know, I, I am all for and always trying to do better in terms of my language. Just making sure that I'm using language that makes people feel seen, makes people feel included and respected, which a lot of y'all hate because anytime that I use gender neutral language, 
people get very offended. But yeah, I think that this is really good insight right here. But the problem with that is it's difficult with obesity. I'm, I'm admitting it. You know, I'm an uh -huh. expert in this field, but it's difficult because obesity is one of the diseases, maybe the only one, that we look at somebody and we might know. We, we don't know if they have obesity, but obesity has to do with, you know, our health. But by looking at somebody, we see their physical appearance. How are we diagnosing people? I'm actually curious. Wait a second. Okay, I think I was supposed to watch this part first. I think we get an obesity, not definition, but maybe like how we're diagnosing people in this one. We're, we're going on this journey together, everybody. Absolutely. Why do we call obesity a disease? We call it disease because there is malfunction in how the body is operating. And there's two primary pathways of the brain that actually regulate weight. One pathway is our anorexigenic pathway. When we hear anorexigenic, what do we hear? We have less food intake and less food storage. Now, we have a different pathway of the brain, and when patients have overweight and obesity, they're typically upregulating the orexigenic pathway of the brain. Orexigenic is the opposite of anorexigenic. That pathway supports storage of adipose. Adipose is a fancy word for fat. Now, I just threw out a lot of vocabulary there. Yeah. But that tells us that there is dysfunction in how the body is regulating weight. I think she's stretching the truth a little bit here. Because again, we energy cannot be created nor destroyed, right? It's just how our planet works. I think that what she's talking about is the fact that, and this has been proven in different studies, and I'll, I'll try to find it and link it below, but people who are obese typically have higher hunger signals in their brain, like they produce more ghrelin, which is the hunger hormone, than people who uh, live in smaller bodies. And so because of that, they typically will listen to those cues and ingest more, leading to obesity, right? And this is why a lot of people, when they get put on these GLP-1 agonists or you know things like Ozempic and Wagovi, a lot of them talk about how like their food chatter is gone. So a lot of the times it is regulating those hormones in the brain. So that is a real thing. But to put it this way is very misleading. Can Absolutely. you explain that? Why for some, they're just overeaters and some it's a disease because of the brain thing, right? Absolutely. Well, it's about how much we take in and how much we store. So we all have those friends. My husband is here in the audience. He's this friend of mine who can eat whatever he wants and he doesn't really store that. And you're like, how is that even possible? We need to remember also that doctors, like medical doctors, receive very little training in nutrition. So the fact that this woman is on television as a doctor, perpetuating the idea that her husband stores energy differently than her and not talking about the fact that he just has a faster metabolism for probably a host of reasons, genetic, movement, muscle mass, whatever it is, is like kind of insane. I think we have enough here to go off of. If you wanna watch those clips, I'm gonna leave them below. Again, they're definitely causing me to not be able to monetize this video, so there goes some rent money. So these videos are from about six months ago. I did take the time to watch Oprah's very recent town hall, which was like all about weight loss. It was all about weight loss drugs, which again, I don't wanna to talk too much about in this video, but it all feels a little sponsored. I just feel like we're taking the control out of the picture. Like a lot of this messaging is just very, it's not your fault, it's just that your brain is different. And that's fine, but I think it then also strips people of like, I don't wanna say personal accountability because that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about having the option to do something about it. Like it might feel good for a second to be like, it's not your fault, your brain is just different. But then like, what do you do with that information from there? Take a weight loss drug forever? Maybe, that's fine. Like that is an option for people, but I think that we we don't talk about the other options enough. So I wanna talk first about what these options are, but then I wanna tell you why they're really hard. If you are someone who is looking for weight loss, the number one things that I recommend in this order for most people, <laughs> nutrition, sleep, daily movement, stress, and then your formal workouts. Nutrition changes are going to be the easiest way to control our energy balance, but it's also a really tough skill to like actually track calories. It's very difficult to get that accurate, but like we keep talking about it, it really is calories in, calories out. And I'm actually surprised they didn't talk about hormones once in any of this, because that's the big thing that you hear. But one of the things that will help with your hormonal regulation is your sleep and then obviously your stress. And then in terms of energy out, your daily movement, like your steps, that's going to be a huge part of the pie. And then finally, any of your formal workouts, hopefully you are getting some strength training in there because strength training is also going to help with your hormonal regulation. Why can't I say that word? Hormonal, hormonal, hormonal. 
regulation. You're also going to put a little bit more lean muscle mass on the body, which it's a small number, but it will help use more energy at rest because muscle mass does take more energy to preserve than fat mass. But let's talk about why this is really hard to implement, especially in the good old US of A. We are just really not set up for a healthy lifestyle here. I am very blessed that I live in a walkable city with like every nutritious option on the planet and I work for myself. So like at two o'clock today, I'm going to go to the gym. Most people can't do that. Most people work really long days. A lot of people on the weekends are either too exhausted to do anything or have to work a side hustle to make ends meet because the economy right now, <laughs> groceries are too expensive. We have a mostly unwalkable country. There's so little education about like how to actually feed ourselves as we're growing up because a lot of things, unfortunately, are kind of like lobbied in government to sell more of. Um, that's a topic for a whole nother video. But I think the point of this is like, there are people with huge platforms who unfortunately push healthy options on us that maybe aren't always telling the full picture. Obviously, Oprah was with Weight Watchers for a long time, which is a great tool for certain people. I think there's something a little morally murky about their company. I know she's done like liquid fast diets and was she with Atkins at some point too? The like no carb thing. So the point I'm trying to make is that just because someone is famous does not mean that they know what they're talking about. And unfortunately the experts that Oprah brings on and works with aren't telling the full picture. And it seems like they have ulterior motives because the big picture, which is not only nutrition, sleep, stress, strength training, daily movement is pretty boring pretty unsexy and then really hard to implement in this country and would probably require huge changes in our entire culture to implement. That's the video. <laughs> Great, please go watch a second video so that I can make a little money. Bye.